All right, guys, I realize I've made like 10 videos on the Schwarzschild metric, and it might be getting a little boring by this point, but it's a really important space-time geometry in general relativity. It's mathematically convenient and gives tons of insight and predictions. Anyway, this video is going to be about deriving the individual geodesic equations for the Schwarzschild metric, which we'll later use to derive some properties of the geodesics in Schwarzschild geometry, which I'll conveniently refer to as Schwarzschild geodesics. So let's once again recall a few facts from our previous videos beginning with the Schwarzschild metric. Remember that the line element for a spherically symmetric spacetime geometry is the following. This will be equation 1. R sub s is the Schwarzschild radius, and the coordinates corresponding to this line element are defined as follows. Now the metric tensor corresponding to this line element also has a bunch of non-zero second-kind Christoffel symbols that it's associated with. I've copy-pasted those Christoffel symbols here. Note that the functions a and b are exclusively functions of r, given by the following. These are just the r, r, and t, t components of the Schwarzschild metric. I've just written them in the Christoffel symbols as a and b for ease of notation. So in order to derive the geodesic equations for the Schwarzschild metric, let's go back to the general geodesic equation we derived back in my tensor calculus series. I put the link to the video in the description if you want a refresher on how we did it. I'll call this equation 2. The p here is a free index from 0 to n minus 1, where n denotes the dimension of the space or space-time you're in. In relativity, we have three spatial dimensions and one temporal dimension, so n is 4, which means that p varies from 0 to 3. You can, of course, have p go from 1 to 4 instead of 0 to 3, but because we use the index 0 for our time coordinate and our Christoffel symbols, I've just let p start at 0 for the sake of consistency. But because p is a free index that can take on any integer from 0 to 3, this geodesic equation is actually a system of four differential equations, one for each coordinate. So the x super 0 represents the t coordinate, x super 1 represents r, and x super 2 and 3 represent the theta and phi coordinates respectively when we're talking about Schwarzschild geometry. Now the s is actually pretty critical in all this. The s represents our arc length parameter. This means that when you solve the geodesic equations, the function you'll get for each of our four coordinates will be a function of the arc length along your geodesic curve. It won't just be some random parameter, it'll be the arc length. If we use some other parameter, this zero on the right-hand side of equation two is actually going to be a non-zero term, and we'll have a mathematically more cumbersome geodesic equation. But let's turn this arc length parameter into something more relatable in general relativity. Let's first go back to special relativity. Recall that the proper time tau taken by a particle that travels along a time-like path in our four-dimensional space-time hypersurface, recall that this proper time is directly related to the length or distance traveled by the particle by the following equation. S here is the arc length or space-time distance traveled by the particle along our particular path. It's a space-time distance, not just a spatial distance. If instead my particle traveled an infinitesimally small distance ds with a corresponding infinitesimal proper time interval d tau, then the relationship between d tau and ds would be the following, very similar to our non-infinitesimal relationship. Of course, these two equations are both from my special relativity series. This should hopefully just be a refresher for you. It's essentially the definition of proper time. If I now rearrange this infinitesimal equation in terms of ds squared, I'll get ds squared equals negative c squared d tau squared. If we now plug this into equation 2, our geodesic equation, here's what we'll get. The c squared terms cancel, leaving our geodesic equation with just the derivatives with respect to proper time. So this is our general geodesic equation in general relativity, where the arc length parameter has been converted to the proper time. Of course, this conversion only applies for time-like curves. Proper time only exists for time-like curves where the space-time distance is negative by our sign convention. Otherwise, the square root for the proper time will be the square root of a negative number if it's a space-like curve, and that's just not possible. If it's a light-like curve, the proper time will be zero, so again, it doesn't count. So this geodesic equation only applies for situations where the proper time is a meaningful quantity, so only for a time-like curve. Anyway, I'm going to call this modified geodesic equation in terms of proper time equation 3. So now we're in the position where we can formulate the geodesic equations for each of our coordinates. We'll start with the angular coordinates, which are easier to deal with, beginning with the phi coordinate. The phi coordinate corresponds to p equals 3, so our geodesic equation for this coordinate becomes the following. 
Let's go back up to our non-zero Christoffel symbols. The only non-zero Christoffel symbols which have a superscript of 3 are gamma super 3 sub 3 1 and 1 3, as well as gamma super 3 sub 2 2. So if we plug in these non-zero Christoffel symbols, our geodesic equation becomes the following. If we plug in these non-zero Christoffel symbols and substitute the x super 1, 2, and 3 for the coordinates r, theta, and phi, here's what we end up with. I'm now going to do two things. I'll move the sine phi cosine phi term to the right and take 1 over r squared common from the left hand side that remains to get the following equation. Let's now look at the left hand side more closely. The term in the parentheses looks a lot like the product rule applied to r squared times the derivative of phi with respect to tau, so if we use that fact to simplify things on the left, here's what we'll get. Now, because of the spherical symmetry inherent in Schwarzschild geometry, we can really just orient our axes however we wish. So we can just suppose without loss of generality that phi is set to pi by 2. We actually did something similar when we derived Flam's paraboloid. We set phi to pi by 2 without any loss of generality. When we do this, the cosine phi on the right hand side becomes 0. We can now get rid of the 1 over r squared and then integrate both sides with respect to tau to get the following where c sub phi here is an integration constant, because we've integrated with respect to tau, c sub phi is a constant in time. Now if d phi by d tau is 0 at one instant, then assuming we're not at the singularity, so r is at least positive, the constant c sub phi is also 0 at that instant, just based on this geodesic equation. But because c sub phi is a constant in time, this means that if c sub phi is 0 at one instant, it's 0 for all proper time. This then implies that d phi by d tau will also be zero for all proper time. And the other nice thing about spherical symmetry is that we can actually set d phi by d tau to zero at a particular instant without loss of generality if we orient our axes appropriately. Let me go on the side to explain how. So suppose I've got a spherical mass m right here and that I have this tiny little particle going around that mass. Suppose that at a particular instant, at a particular proper time, the particle is going in this direction. The particle here is my object of interest. It's the particle whose geodesics I'm trying to solve for. Now because of spherical symmetry, I can select a positive z-axis orientation such that the phi coordinate of my particle is pi by 2. And there's multiple possible z-axis orientations that would allow phi to be pi by 2 for my particle. I've drawn them here, but there's only one possible z-axis orientation that would allow my phi to be pi by 2 at this instant, and allow the time derivative of phi to be 0 at this instant, so this particle's phi coordinate doesn't instantaneously change for that particular instant. So I can select my coordinate system by z-axis, such that phi equals pi by 2, and d phi by d tau for my particle doesn't change at that instant, regardless of what my particle is doing at that instant, regardless of where exactly it's going. But if we take this conclusion and apply it to my geodesic equation for phi, then I can conclude that if I'm able to orient my coordinate system such that d phi by d tau for my particle's geodesic path is zero at one particular instant, then that d phi by d tau is always zero for all proper time. And that's all because of this integration constant. If my d phi by d tau is zero at an instant, which I can set up by choosing the appropriate coordinate orientation, then c sub phi is zero at that instant. But if c sub phi is zero at an instant, it's always zero. And if it's always zero, that means the tau derivative of phi is then always zero by extension. So because of spherical symmetry and my phi geodesic equation, I can set my phi to pi by 2 without loss of generality and choose my coordinate axes such that d phi by d tau is always 0. And if d phi by d tau is always 0, that means my Schwarzschild geodesics are confined to two spatial dimensions. So let's take all of this phi geodesic equation stuff and move it off to the side so we can focus on the theta geodesic equation. The theta coordinate corresponds to p equals 2 in our geodesic equation, so the geodesic equation for theta is the following. The non-zero Christoffel symbols with the superscript 2 are the gamma super 2 sub 1, 2, and 2, 1, and the gamma super 2 sub 2, 3, and 3, 2. If we plug those in and replace our x with the superscripts by the appropriate coordinates, here's what we get. Now the d phi by d tau is 0 based on what we just discussed with our phi geodesic, so we can get rid of that and get a more simplified equation for our theta geodesic. Now if I take the 1 over r squared outside, I get the following equation. The part inside the brackets now is really just the product rule applied to r squared times the tau derivative of theta. If I then write the term in brackets using this product rule, here's what I get.
Now, assuming we aren't sitting at the singularity at r equals zero, we can get rid of this one over r squared term and integrate the stuff that's left inside to get r squared times d theta by d tau equals l. I'll call this equation four. Now the small case L has the SI units of meter squared times radians per second, which in fact happen to be the units of angular momentum divided by mass. Recall from classical mechanics that angular momentum is basically the moment of inertia times the angular velocity in radians per second. Moment of inertia has units of kilograms times meter squared, and omega has units of radians per second, so the units of angular momentum are then kilograms times meter squared radian per second. So that's why small l, our integration constant for the theta geodesic, has units of angular momentum per mass. In fact, it describes the angular momentum of my tiny particle traveling in Schwarzschild geometry per unit mass. Which means that if l is my constant of integration, then l is constant with proper time. And because l is constant with proper time, l is a conserved quantity. So what this means is that based on the geodesic equation for theta, we can conclude that in Schwarzschild geometry, angular momentum is conserved for geodesics of our particles. Let's now move all this theta stuff to the side and work on the geodesic equation for the time coordinate. There's only two non-zero Christoffel symbols with the superscript zero, and those are gamma super zero sub zero one and sub one zero. We'll plug those in and replace the x's by the corresponding coordinate variables to get the following equation. Now, I've just left the b as is instead of changing it to the function of r. That's again done for ease of writing. We'll now multiply both sides by b to get the following equation. Again, you'll notice that the left-hand side is basically the end result of the product rule applied to the tau derivative of b times dt by d tau. So if we now integrate both sides with respect to the proper time, we'll find that b times the tau derivative of t is some constant k, which is constant with proper time and therefore represents a conserved quantity, similar to the angular momentum per mass like we just discussed. But k here is dimensionless, it has no units, which makes finding its physical meaning a bit more tricky, but we can still manage. Let me show you how. Let's suppose we go all the way out to a radial coordinate that's really far away from the main mass, capital M, so r approaches infinity. In that case, b approaches 1, and we basically end up in a flat Minkowski space. So according to our time geodesic equation in this Minkowski space, the k equals the tau derivative of t. But we also know from special relativity that the tau derivative of t is gamma, the Lorentz factor, inverse of the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. Recall also that the relativistic energy of a particle in special relativity is gamma mc squared, so that means we can rewrite our gamma as e over mc squared. And because gamma equals k this far out in our geometry, we can also write k equal to e over mc squared. But this rule for k doesn't just apply at r approaches infinity, it also applies to closer values of r. So k equals e over mc squared everywhere, but even at closer radial coordinates. It's just that this time, at some closer value of r, your energy isn't just the relativistic kinetic energy plus the rest energy like it is in Minkowski space. The energy now, when you have a closer value value of r, that energy also includes gravitational potential energy. Now since k, so the energy, is a constant in a Schwarzschild geodesic, that means the energy must be conserved. This is basically conservation of energy in Schwarzschild geometry, and it's a consequence of the geodesic equation for the time coordinate, which then becomes the following once you plug the k back in. I'll call this equation 5. So now let's finally move this time geodesic stuff to the side and focus on the geodesic equation for the radial coordinate, which is given by the following. P is 1 this time, so that means we'll have several second kind Christoffel symbols that are non-zero. If we plug those non-zero symbols in and change the x-coordinates to the names of the actual Schwarzschild coordinates, this is what we'll have. Now, the tau derivative of phi is zero from our phi geodesic equation, and we can also set our phi to pi by two without loss of generality, as we discussed before. When we do this, our radial geodesic equation simplifies to this. We also know from our time and theta geodesic equations that dt by d tau is k over capital B, and d theta by d tau is our angular momentum per unit mass L divided by r squared. Plugging this into our radial geodesic equation and simplifying a little yields this. Now, we can simplify this equation further by recognizing that if we take 1 over 2 times the derivative of r times a outside, what's left inside is actually the tau derivative of the following, this quantity in the parentheses. 
So assuming that the tau derivative of r isn't always zero, we can get rid of this coefficient term and integrate both sides to find that this quantity in the parentheses is another integration constant. Now this constant is something we'll discuss in the next video, but we've now officially derived the geodesic equations for each of the Schwarzschild coordinates. I'd like to thank the following patrons for their support, and if you enjoyed this lesson, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.